So as Shrek and Donkey are walking together, Shrek says, for your information, there's a lot more to ogres than people think. Donkey says, example. Shrek says, example. Okay, ogres are like onions. And he pulls one out. And the donkey sh sniffs it and says, they stink. And Shrek says, yes, no. And Donkey says, they make you cry. And Shrek says, no. And Donkey says, you leave them in the sun and they get all brown and start sprouting little white hairs. And Shrek says, no, layers. Onions have layers. Ogres have layers. Onions have layers. You get it? We both have layers. And Donkey says, oh, you both have layers. And sniffing, he says, you know, not everybody likes onions. Cakes. Everybody likes cakes. Cakes have layers. <laughs> Shrek says, I don't care what everybody likes. Ogres are not like cakes. And then they launch into parfaits, you know. Parfaits are delicious. And Shrek says, no, you dense little irritating and miniature beast of burden. Ogres are like onions. Layers. Parables have layers. And so we walk into a parable that has a lot of layers. And they all do. So if we walk into a parable and we walk in literally and we take them as the story of historical fact, then we encounter these endless questions that are usually unanswerable and portray God in ways that well, quite honestly, just make me flinch. And if we treat a parable as merely a metaphor or symbolic story with no real life implications, well, it just doesn't seem to work. The layers of a parable transcend time and help us enter into daily life. And entering into it, it has us see this world and the realm of God in a new way. So what is it saying to us today? Like this first layer, this top and easiest one, of course, is God is concerned about the poor. And if God's concerned, God expects us to be as well. Hebrew scriptures and New Testament is really clear on the topic. And living out our care and compassion reveals that reality of God's presence in our life. However, it's totally an overstep to say that just caring for the poor alone is like this ticket into heaven. Scripture has some clear indicators that those who think they can buy their way into heaven might want to read again. Seeing the Lazaruses of the world, the poor, the hungry, those in need, working to house the homeless and care for the sick, visiting the prisoners and working for justice. This is work that we do because it's to be who we are and how God's people are simply to be. And the question isn't, what's in it for us? But rather, how can we help make life a bit better, more balanced, and the world a little more equal and a little bit more like God would dream, would want. This is what Christianity and our faith, our experience of Jesus Christ, is offering for those who struggle. And now that next layer, it would offer us a chance to see that there's a relationship between this life and the next life, however you would define it. The choices we make, the words we speak, and the actions we take have consequences. Now please realize I'm not pushing this too far because we serve a God of grace and forgiveness and endless second chances. This is a parable this is not a systematic explanation or theological analysis of heaven and hell. This is not Jesus declaring and laying a judgment in which all rich people go to hell and all poor people go to heaven. This is not that. Jesus didn't do that sort of thing. 
He taught about the realm of God, the here and now in which we live. And it's a reminder that our lives are connected and intertwined in this world and the next. In the words of St. Anthony the Great, our life and our death is with our neighbor. Now a little bit further in, in that universal layer where we are awakened to a reality, where we can perceive ourselves as either the rich man or Lazarus. Because circumstances and situations change. We can probably all name times when life has been so good and we have felt abundantly blessed And in like manner, we can name times when life has simply left us destitute and broken, feeling so sorrowful and suffering. The parable is not asking us to make judgments about who's the rich man and who is Lazarus. Instead, it's a chance to ponder. It's asking us to acknowledge and deal with the gates and chasms that separate us from each other. Throughout this parable, the distance, the chasms are the one constant. The beginning to the end of the parable, it's full of divisions and separations. We have the gate at the beginning. On the one side of the gate is Lazarus. And he is there with sores and dog spit, hungry and unable to get up and walk. And on the other side, there is the rich man dressed in fine linen and purple, sitting at his table, feasting every day. And then the bookend at the end with the chasm where Lazarus is seated comforted in the bosom of Abraham, while on the other hand, the rich man stands, tormented in the flame of Hades. The gate and the chasm are the same thing. It's where we're divided and broken and separated from one another. We're asked to see the chasm that separates Lazarus and the rich man in the next world as simply a manifestation of the gate that separated them in this world. The rich man carried it with him into whatever his next world would be. It was a part of him. The gate that separates and divides us in this world, it's not a condition, it's not circumstance or a category, rich or poor, Muslim or Christian, LBGTQIA or H or any other category you want to add to the list. The gate, it's a condition of the human heart. The gate becomes this chasm that exists within us before it exists between us. The gate or chasm can even be something as obscure as those who participate in and appreciate a church garage sale and those who really don't or who are neutral to them. And after this week, the past few weeks, I was really tempted to have signs so that if you participated or really like them, you sit on one side and if you don't or are neutral, you sit on the other because there is a chasm between in the church because mulling over this text in my mind, in my heart, as the garage sale was ramping up, I had this moment for transcendence and conversion in my life. And the chasm was bridged as I saw the fullness of ministry and love that was poured into one of these events. It was this place in the church, the body of Christ, where everything was present and active. It was where in moments of grief, when a family was uncertain 
What do I do with my loved one's furnishings? When pieces have been taken, but these things are left, and I don't want to just put them away, I can give them to the church. And what about mom's jewelry? When family has taken the few pieces they want, it almost felt disrespectful to just box it up. I could give it to the church. There's something respectful and loving in that. And after two plus years of being confined and isolated, people came together for a mission and a cause and a ministry. And folks who wanted to unburden themselves of some belongings could bring them to the church and meet others. You see, through donating things and talking again and gathering at the church, I saw all these things in a garage sale. And I bridged this chasm that I didn't even know I had. Garage sales are not about material possessions rich man and Lazarus. They're about living compassion and love and ministry and mission in this very real way. This parable was perfect to preach this weekend because it invited me and asked me to examine my own heart and find a gate that separated me, maybe from myself, maybe from my neighbors, maybe from others, or whoever it might be, and maybe even from God, and I didn't even know it. You see, we might not fully be aware of those gates, and we might be able to list off those top layers, like fear or anger or greed or prejudice or pride or loneliness, any of those things, but This parable invites us to the possibilities for the gates within us that we might not even know. Invites us to see all those ways we are intended to live. Invites us through the eyes of Jesus to understand those chasms that might destroy relationships because they unmake God's creation. And I don't know what those gates or chasms might be that you carry, but every time we love our neighbor as ourselves or every time we love a stranger just by an act of kindness, every time we treat one another as someone created in the image or likeness of God, gates are opened and chasms are bridged. When we do this, we live as God calls us to live. It's a choice that's set before us every day. It can happen in marriages and families, at work, at school, in parking lots, in garage sales, and in our prayers in the world. It can happen in the most intimate and difficult of relationships. And it's not easy work, but it's possible. Jesus demonstrated it in his life, his death and resurrection. Gates were opened and chasms are bridged. Christ's love and mercy and grace, his presence made it and makes it possible. So may we be open to seeing those gates and chasms in our life and then let us be willing to bridge them. This is our work within the realm of God in this world. We already have everything we need. Was that not one of the other layers embedded in what Abraham and Moses and the prophets and Jesus were saying to us? 
if only we would listen. Amen.